My name is Brian Champion. I'm coordinator of the lectures for the library and I'm also the political science librarian. We welcome you again to this wonderful lecture that will be presented by Doug Smoot, whom we know as a professor and dean, both emeritus colleagues. He, has, uh, he wears many hats here at BYU. He's a noted uh, and accomplished researcher and professor, and he also is something of an historian and genealogist. We're delighted to have him with us today. Please welcome Doug Smoot. Thank you, Brian. Uh, we have uh, proved to ourselves again how difficult it is to park on this campus, and we'll expect others, even some of my family, to wander in uh, before the lecture's over. Uh, I, it is a very special occasion for myself and uh, family to present this uh, uh, lecture on the historic and very valuable documents that our family is just in the process of uh, completing donation to. Uh, to the L. Tom Perry Special Collections uh, Library at uh, BYU. I thank all uh, families and friends and uh, neighbors and colleagues and uh, campus people uh, for uh, participating in this event and uh, hope you will enjoy uh, the occasion as much as I did the opportunity to uh, prepare it and prepare for this occasion. What I am talking about, of course, uh, comes from the uh, collection of documents that we have uh, just recently concluded uh, uh, a donation process for the library. Some acknowledgments. Uh, first, uh, uh, certainly Abraham Owen Smoot, uh, born in 1815, uh, uh, actually died in 1895. You don't get the slides perfect. Uh, from uh, For preserving these documents, I've often uh, 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 thought that uh, A.O. was influenced by Wilfred Woodruff, who was a, a remarkable uh, record keeper. Uh, and uh, A.O. served a mission with him in 1836, and the oldest of the documents that were in the set were dated to 1836. His wife, Diana Eldridge, she was the last of his living wives at the time of his death, and I suppose that's why the collection came to her. To my grandfather, Orson Parley, and uh, my grandmother, Helen Condor Smoot, uh, and, uh, who uh, were uh, helping uh, Di uh, Diana in her last years. Uh, her home still stands on uh, East Center Street in Provo. And uh, at, at, uh, Orson Parley died when I was very young, and Helen Condor, uh, my grandmother Smoot, uh, uh, we knew well, and I spoke at her funeral uh, uh, many years ago, however. My Aunt Cleo Smoot Bullock, who had no children, uh, uh, had the documents in her possession at the time that uh, Helen, uh, Aunt Hel uh, Grandma Helen died. And that's about as good a path as I know as to how on earth they came to me. She had no children, and I, she uh, thought of me as her, uh, her uh, son in many ways. And uh, in 1991, she came to me and said, uh, you have to come down here and see what's in this box. And of course, my lecture, and this, uh, these papers are what, what uh, was in that box. My family, uh, uh, all here gathered, uh, Marion, uh, Annalee uh, Folster, Lucinda Lewis, uh, Michelle Hyde, and Mindy uh, Robbins uh, for uh, participating and uh, supporting me in this uh, donation. The Harold uh, B. Lee Library, L. Tom Perry Special Collections, uh, John Murphy uh, uh, there for cleaning and indexing the collection and his colleagues that I'll recognize subsequently. The director of the library, uh, the entire library, Randy Olson, for arrangements regarding the donation. And for the document appraisers, Kurt Bench, uh, Benchmark Books in Salt Lake City, and Brent Ashworth, uh, a, a local historic uh, document collector whom uh, Kurt asked to assist. I'll talk about these points, an overview of his life, about the collection and the appraisal, the most valuable documents. Uh, each of the, his, the end of his uh, earthly ministry and uh, the commemorative booklet. I'll read this to you if you'll uh, 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 allow me because uh, this is from the appraisal. This was written by Kurt Bench and I thought you'd like to see his perceptions. He's, of course, making a case for the value of the documents. Abraham O. Smoot, 1815 to 1895, was a prominent member and leader of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, referred to her after as the LDS or Mormon Church, or simply the Church. Now a worldwide organization of over 12 million members, he began his affiliation with the Mormons in 1835, a critical period in church history. 
He associated the work and worked closely with uh, most of the leading lights of Mormonism from the start, including Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, John Taylor, Wilfred Woodruff, the first four presidents of the church, and many others. He was president in many of the major church sites of the 19th century and participated in the main events as the saints, namely LDS church members, were driven from state to t state and finally to Utah. He served many times as a missionary, uh, my count is about nine, and uh, as a local uh, church leader, branch president, bishop, high counselor, stake president, he had extensive experience as a businessman and a government official, served for years in the Utah Territorial Legislature and as mayor of both Provo and Salt Lake City. He was instrumental in founding and preserving of the Brigham Young Academy, which later became Brigham Young University. In recognition of his invaluable assistance and influence there, BYU named its administration building in Smoot's honor. Smoot was universally re highly regarded and was widely praised for his many accomplishments. A.O. Smoot's prominence and noteworthy accomplishments in the LDS Church in Utah are important factors in making his donated papers considerably more valuable than had he been a minor, less known uh, character. It is fitting and also significant that the collection of documents belonging to or associated with one who has such a lasting impact on Brigham University is being donated to this institution. A few additional insights that uh, I'll share with you so that those who aren't so well acquainted with uh, Abraham uh, Owen Smoot uh, might know more. He uh, records uh, six wives. Uh, uh, my uh, uh, cousin and uh, who is here, Loretta Nixon and I, uh, wrote a book about uh, his life earlier and uh, it documents this history. 26 children or more expelled from Missouri and Illinois with the saints nine missions from south the south to England to the Sandwich Islands, first president of the Brigham Young Academy Board of Trustees, served from its founding in 1875, a call from Brigham Young, to his uh, death in 1895. He was also leader of the Perpetual Immigration Front, the photographs you can see here, uh, he, two of his wives, the, the one on your uh, right is uh, my great-grandmother. Abraham Owen Smoot, document collection history. Uh, I've talked about lots, lots of this earlier, so I'll skip much of it. You can see, though, that the documents he wrote were from 1836 to 1895. They continued to be collected from 95 to 1914 at the death of Diana, and then uh, uh, five documents were added between 1922 and 1961, largely dealing with the uh, 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 reunions of the family. Uh, I've said all of the rest of that history that you can look at briefly. And uh, so I think I'll move on with the uh, comment that uh, my aunt uh, Cleo Smoot Bullock, who was uh, deceased in the, uh, in the last uh, decade, uh, there holds the uh, box, the bread box, in which these documents were uh, located in her basement when she uh, passed them on to me. In all, there are about 257 documents. Uh, the university categorized that number. Many are multi-paged, however, uh, many, many, and some of the documents have within them eight or ten documents themselves, as it says there. Uh, from A.O. Smoot's uh, conversion, 1836, to Diana's death in 1914 are all but five. There are estimated uh, uh, 800 sheets of uh, documentation. This is the uh, special collection organization done by uh, John and uh, his assistants, Jana Lloyd and uh, Colette Rasmussen. Series one is A.O. Smoot correspondence from, uh, there are 88 documents there, 1851 to 1914. Series two, the Smoot family genealogy and temples uh, from uh, 120 documents from 1832 to 1914. The Nauvoo, Manti, Salt Lake City, Logan Temples, and the Endowment House uh, are mentioned. Uh, uh, A.O. mentions also in his journal uh, the uh, uh, Kirt Kirtland Temple. Series three, uh, journals and ephemera, 44 documents. Uh, ephemera apparently means other uh, valuable documents. Uh, 1836 to 1914, and then publications, five of those from 52 to 1914. The appraisers uh, I've mentioned already, uh, Mr. Kurt Bench of uh, Benchmark Books, certified appraiser, and uh, uh, Brent Ashworth assisting him. Uh, they were appraised at about the first uh, quarter of them in 1995. It took so long and, and, and so much work to do that, and then uh, the balance was completed in uh, 1996. And uh, 
uh, we have been working on this uh, donation process for about three years to get this completed. The most uh, valuable documents, among the most, uh, they are from 1836 to 1856. His personal junior, uh, journal that goes from 1836, December to April of 1837. A patriarchal blessing by Joseph Smith Sr. in uh, January of 1837. His Nauvoo Temple Diary, December 18, uh, of 1845 to February of 1846. His mission call to the British Isles, September 1851. The John M. McFarland Diary, dating from February 10, 1852 to September 3, 1852. Uh, uh, accounting or recounting the experiences and the day-to-day -day activities of a group of saints leaving Liverpool uh, and arriving in Salt Lake Valley. Now I want to talk uh, briefly uh, about these uh, documents, uh, not just all that history, but share you more personal kinds of things. And uh, the first one that we'll talk about is his journal. I've shown you some uh, photographs there and an earlier uh, painting actually by Corvello. This hangs in Reed Smoot's entry area in the historic Smoot home uh, down by the city county, the county buildings. Uh, and uh, uh, he says the following uh, in, in places there. I'll just cite a little, of course, it's many pages long. Uh, 1836, December 25th, administered to by Elder Parrish, was delivered in a great day for my disease. December 26th, Monday attended, six. Uh, sick. December uh, 27, 28, 29, 30, and 31 show the same enter, uh, entries, uh, lay sick. Then the uh, next part, which is uh, January 1st, uh, 1837, he says the following, O God, the Eternal Father, I ask the Son of the bosom that thou wilt grant unto me a full and complete deliverance from this my bodily infirmity that my mind may be invigorated, that I may accomplish the purpose that I have come to this place. Uh, he's in uh, Kirtland at the time. To do, uh, and I pray the Holy Father that thou wilt prepare my mind and heart for solemn assembly in the spring, that I may hold correspondence with some heavenly messenger, yea, that I may see uh, within the veil, that I may have a revelation of the Son of God, that I may be a special witness of Jesus unto the nations of the earth and uh, unto whom thou shalt call uh, me to testify. It would be wonderful to go on with that. Uh, I sense a, a remarkably strong and powerful testimony for a person that had uh, been baptized uh, just about uh, 20 months. The, the uh, second of the documents is the patriarchal blessing I spoke of. This is a part of it. Uh, that as much as we could get on the screen, it's about twice that long. It's a full page. And uh, Joseph Smith Sr. pronounced this uh, uh, just after that last uh, entry in his journal, and it was recorded in the hand of Wilfred Woodruff. Those who are historians know that Wilfred's, uh, Woodruff's hand was very neat. And uh, if you could be close, some of you closer might even be able to read that. But let me share you a point or two from this. Uh, be faithful, brother. Oh, I'll, I'll read the caption first at the top. Elder Abram, they call him here, uh, uh, O. Smoot, patriarchal blessing received under the hands of Patriarch Joseph Smith Sr. on the 23rd day of January, 1837, in the town of Kirtland, Ohio. Uh, and uh, then uh, uh, just a little part, uh, as much as time allows. Uh, be faithful, uh, uh, brother, and thou shalt have health and be blessed in thy labors and have many souls as seals of thy ministry. Thou shalt have great wisdom. Many shall seek wisdom at thy mouth. Thou shalt have brothers uh, 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 faith uh, like unto Enoch and Abram. Thy life shall be lengthened out until the coming of the Savior, if it be necessary, and thou desirest it. Thou shalt have a, a posterity, and they shall be blessed on earth, for thou shalt have a companion that shall be a consolation unto thee. And I could go on and on about the promises. One or two things that strike me briefly there. First, it, from other things I've read in uh, church history, it, it did seem to me and does seem that the saints at the time were uh, awaiting uh, with a relatively near-term uh, possibility the, the uh, second coming of the Savior. And uh, I found that interesting in that uh, patriarchal blessing. Uh, 
uh, the uh, next document uh, that uh, I want to share with you is the uh, is the uh, document that uh, the third one uh, at the Nauvoo Temple. Now, those of you who know history, and many of you would know this, it was the Nauvoo Temple was just completed for ordinances, sacred temple ordinances, uh, in in about that time, in late 1845. Uh, and by February 1845, early February, I understand that it was closed. And the saints uh, crossed the frozen uh, Mississippi River in very early February, 3rd or 4th of February, the first vanguard, if I recall. And so this is a diary that he kept daily entries on, on his experiences. He, he received, as you'll see, his uh, sacred ordinances in the temple. And at the same time, uh, he also worked in the temple. I can't share much of it. It's many pages long, but a little. Uh, December uh, 18th, Thursday, having been uh, called on by the Council of the Twelve, I went to the temple to receive my endowments at the, hand, at the hour of eight o'clock. I was conducted into, I'm skipping in places, you only get a part of the total, into the washing and anointing room where I received my washings uh, in clean and pure water preparatory to my anointing which was pronounced uh, under the hands of Samuel Benton, president of the High Council. I was then presented with the garment bearing the marks of the Holy Priesthood. And then moving on a little bit, I was now prepared uh, for uh, reception of further ordinances in the house of the Lord, which was to me sublime, great, and glorious, uh, making uh, my mind uh, indelibly impressed of the Holy Priesthood and of course, uh, then he goes on to talk about, as we'll see, uh, uh, receiving his, uh, his, uh, let me get that out of order, yeah. Uh, receiving his uh, sacred uh, endowments. On, uh, on the fifth uh, Sunday, uh, 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 this is the 5th of January, I labored in further ordinances of the endowments in the capacity of James. Interesting that he's uh, working in the temple. Uh, on January the 9th, Friday, I returned to the temple, and in the afternoon I was called on uh, to the sacred altar in the house of the Lord to receive the seal of covenant between myself and my wife Margaret, and also Sarah Gibbons, was there given me in the seal of covenant. Find that interesting uh, terminology, and uh, you probably find it insightful to see ordinances that were taking place there. Uh, the next is Saturday, uh, the 17th of January, a day of great and uh, importance uh, to me. It gave birth to the greatest uh, uh, sublime and higher exaltation of the priesthood than uh, heretofore I had uh, uh, anticipated by me, I received my second ordinances in the priesthood uh, and my wife Margaret, uh, with my wife Margaret and sister Sarah Gibbons, under the hands of George Miller, president of the High Council, in room number four, the attic story of the Nauvoo Temple. Well, I'll pause there, but you can see how precious and valuable this document is, just a few excerpts of which I have uh, uh, read to you. The uh, next of the documents that I'll share with you briefly is, uh, well, that's, I forgot to advance that, I'm sorry. Uh, so you can look at that briefly. You can see an early photograph of Nauvoo with that uh, temple on the hillside. And uh, uh, an, an example of the way that uh, journal, those general en entries looked uh, starting in 1845 and a photograph of A.O. at a, a somewhat uh, more uh, mature age. Uh, now the next one uh, uh, is his British call, uh, mission call to the British Isles, also beautifully written. This is a call that is uh, written in handwriting uh, and uh, signed, if you can see at the bottom probably, by Brigham Young, Heber C. Kimball, and Willard Richards, the first presidency of the church at the time. Many of you will recount in the Doctrine and Covenants, it indicates that uh, if you were to travel in behalf of the church, you need a letter of recommendation so that the uh, the uh, people, the saints, uh, where you go and teach are, are aware uh, of uh, your uh, call and uh, that you have authority. So let me share just a little bit of that too uh, with you. This certifies 
that the bear, bearer, Abraham Owen Smoot, is an elder in good standing in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now, by now, uh, uh, it uh, has the formal name of the church. You remember in the Doctrine and Covenants, the name of the church changed uh, uh, three times to this final name. Uh, and by the general authorities of said church in conference assembled September 7, 1851 at Great Salt Lake City was appointed a mission to preach the gospel under the direction of the presidency of the church in the British Isles. And we pray our Heavenly Father to bless this our brother and prosper him in his mission and bless all who shall uh, uh, bless him that uh, the kingdom of our Lord may roll forth uh, in uh, power until every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is the Christ. Amen. Given under the hand of uh, our hand at the Great Salt Lake City, September 10th, 1851. Now it turns out that uh, uh, A.O. was not to serve very long there. Uh, uh, he, it took him at least a month to arrive there, so presumably he arrived sometime in October. And then uh, uh, by January, he was given a letter, uh, two letters he was written by uh, the president of the British Isles then, Franklin D. Richards, a member of the Twelve. And uh, uh, with that uh, letter, it instructed him to uh, become the leader of the Perpetual uh, Immigration Fund and to lead the, uh, groups of saints from uh, uh, England uh, uh, back to, uh, of course, the Great Salt Lake Valley. Uh, th that brings to, to light, of course, the next document, uh, which is the John McFarland, uh, uh, McFarland uh, diary, February 10th to September of, uh, 3rd of 1852. It's from Liverpool, England, to the Salt Lake Valley. John McFarland was the clerk of the ship, the Ellen Maria, and there were three ships that sailed. On this ship, uh, I'll get to that in a minute, a large number of saints, and he was responsible for keeping a daily entry uh, of the activities. Now, A.O. Smoot was not on this ship, however, he, he, he became the leader of this and other groups that crossed the plains, and so uh, I just presume John McFarland gave uh, this document to A.O. when they arrived in Salt Lake City. Uh, let me share with you, I've only shown you three pages by, uh, uh, and his signature at the bottom, which was concluded. Uh, the, uh, it's about a 40 or so page document, and uh, I've just picked some excerpts so you could get the sense. It says at the top, uh, from John McFarland, M uh, clerk, Liverpool, February 7, 1852. The first entry was seven, but they didn't leave quite that soon, three days later. Passenger ship Ellen Maria, Captain Amherst Whitmore, 367 passengers, 264 adults, 89 children under the age of 14. Elder Isaac Haight, president of the company. Broke bank, February 11, uh, 1851. Tuesday, March 23rd, 10 a.m., Sister Ann Coff, aged 89, oldest passenger on board, died within a few hours and was consigned to a watery grave. Thursday, March 25th, early morning we came in sight of Cuba. Now you understand this uh, sail didn't go to New York. It went uh, across the Atlantic and south around to, you'll see where, past Cuba, and you can imagine. Uh, Wednesday, April 7th, arrived in New Orleans in great health and spirits. President Haight chartered the St. Paul to convey us up the river, of course, the Mississippi River. Uh, Saturday, April 17th, Sister uh, Wheelock's child died of uh, inflammation of the chest uh, as we arrived in St. Louis late in the evening. On the 19th, uh, April, President Haight chartered uh, the, st the steamer St. Ange to take us up the river, of course, the Missouri River. Uh, Sunday the 25th, stopped in Lexington, uh, where we saw the wreck of the steamer Saluda, which had many members of the church, some of you know this story. Uh, he says here, uh, 21 killed, and of course many injured. I remember uh, having participated in some historical work on that with uh, Professor Fred Woods, uh, that uh, there was uh, a larger number than that. A.L. Smoot was there and on the Saluda just before the ship uh, blew up and had counseled the people, this is, uh, I'm uh, digressing for a minute, uh, that th they might find a better ship uh, to go on. Uh, and there was, uh, uh, of course, the river, Missouri River, I've come to understand, was very treacherous to navigate. And of course, A.L. Smoot had been away from the ship about 30 seconds and uh, felt the blast wave. 
as the ship blew up, the boilers they had overheated and they, uh, they uh, blew up. Uh, uh, April 28th, uh, commenced to make our uh, uh, wagon covers. So they've gone now up the Missouri River to the embarking place for the trip across the plains. In the evening, Elder A.O. Smoot arrived in the steamer Isabel with the Perpetual Immigration Fund Saints. It tells also along there four deaths from cholera and uh, uh, in, uh, in, in early May. And A.O. Smoot was sick for several days with cholera, but uh, uh, consistent with the blessing he received from Joseph Smith Sr., he survived that, as along with many other uh, challenges in his life. Lived to be 80, as you saw. Sunday, May 23rd, had a meeting and organized a company. Elder A.O. Smoot was chosen president. June uh, uh, 1st, Tuesday, we yoked the cows, funny word for uh, who were pulling those, I guess, oxen, and had, maybe they were cows, and had made preparation for start of a few miles. Thursday, July 15th, this is six weeks later, started at 8 o'clock and traveled 12 miles, arrived at the crossing of the South Platte. Wednesday, August 4th, traveled 17 and a half miles, camped on uh, Deer Creek near a lot of Indians, supposed to be crows, some of the brethren went across the Platte and killed two buffalo. Sunday, August 8th, started at 6 a.m., traveled 22 miles. Sunday. Now, yes, they stopped, uh, uh, my accounts that I've read, uh, almost always. But here in this case, for uh, reasons that it would be known to them, they considered that they had to travel on that Sabbath day. Uh, Friday, September 3rd, started at 8 o'clock, crossing the last mountains. When we came out of the canyon in full sight of the valley, you can imagine what a remarkable view and vision that was for them. Uh, uh, we found the Nauvoo Brass Band out to meet us, accompanied by uh, uh, the, some of the 12. As we passed Public Square, we were saluted by nine rounds of cannon. And we, we were corralled, that's a funny word too, but they had a lot of animals with them, so why not? In uh, Union Square and addressed by Governor Young. Then his last entry uh, in uh, early September, May the Lord grant that they, namely those on the ship and those that had come, and several died, I only recounted a small number of those that passed away, all be blessed with pure, uh, with, uh, with uh, peace and plenty, and obtain a seat in his celestial kingdom, amen, John C. McFarland, clerk. That's what it shows at the very uh, bottom there in that little entry. Uh, I don't have, I think, other slides on these, but I'll share with you just a couple of other very brief experiences. These are instructions that you may enjoy. Uh, uh, A.O. Smoot was there, and w Wilfred Woodruff was leaving now, and this was uh, April 22nd of 1856, uh, and uh, President Brigham Young met at the mouth of Immigration Canning, Canyon to the missionaries Tuesday morning of that April 22nd before their departure. Now, brethren, I will say that with regard to crossing the plains, I should advise all men to walk, except those who are driving the teams. And I should also advise them never to be so far from the teams as to give the Indians any advantage over them. And then uh, something humorous to me anyway, here's what Brigham says further. I believe that I'm as lazy a man as there is, but uh, I am convinced that I could walk faster across those plains than any team you have got. And I have no question in my mind that you can also. Therefore, go on foot and uh, as much as possible and, uh, and save your teams. Uh, you can see what those people did. Off again to other missionary service. One last one. Uh, this is from St. George. I don't have a view of this one either. Uh, uh, but it's uh, A.O. Smoot. It says at the top, it's a telegraph. And it comes from, it says up here, St. George 31st. Uh, it doesn't have a date, but I believe about 1875, uh, uh, fairly soon before Brigham's passing in 1877. Uh, A.O. Smoot, Provo. Raise sufficient money to buy the machinery needed. Send east for it forthwith. Now they're talking about the woolen mills and, and presumably Provo. Stop your crying about wool, O ye of little faith, and if possible, less works, B.Y. 
That'd be something, wouldn't it? Uh, of course, I think they were very close, and, and uh, Brigham Young leaned on him very heavily uh, in so many ways. Then, of course, if you want the ultimate reprimand, collect $3. Uh, there's the uh, telegraph for you to look at. You can see the collect $3 and BY at the bottom. Of course, that's in the handwriting of the telegrapher in Provo. Margaret Smoot wrote a brief history of A.O. Smoot. It's uh, a touching history. Uh, his first wife, she bore him no children. They, she came with him out of uh, uh, the cold winter of 1838 in, uh, from Missouri. And uh, this was written in 18, uh, does it say 85, I think. Now, some, a few other comments. I'm just concluding now in uh, good time. We'll have a, a, a minute or two for questions if you care. Uh, uh, A.O. Smoot was the third president, uh, stake president, uh, well, stake president, the third stake to be organized in the West. The first in Salt Lake City, the second north in the Ogden area, the third in the Provo area. He served there from 1868 until his death in, in uh, uh, 27 years later in 1895. This is the time that Brigham Young uh, sent A.O. Smoot. He was well settled and happy in uh, Sugar House and uh, serving in so many ways. Uh, and. Uh, uh, but uh, he asked uh, A.O. to come to Provo and see after the saints here. Businesses that I could count, and one thing that I've read, forestry, lumber, manufacturing, woolen mills, banking, sugar, unwavering commitment to the prophets in the church. Six terms as bishop. He, of course, uh, as uh, first president of the, uh, the Board of Trustees, was uh, responsible for having the Brigham Young Academy building built, and, and it was dedicated in 1892. He spoke there, the first presidency spoke there. Carl Mazur spent, spoke there. It was Carl Mazur's last day as uh, principal of, of uh, the Brigham Young Academy. He then became the first commissioner of education for the church. As stake president, A.O. Smoot also uh, built the Provo Library. Now that's not, uh, excuse me, the Provo Tabernacle. That's not the picture. Uh, at the time. It had a big tower in the center, uh, but it was uh, completed in 1895, about the time of his death. And there was a little statue uh, that showed, uh, I mean statue, a little tower that showed right there, quite a big tower, in fact, uh, that was there, but the, uh, uh, in time uh, it slumped and uh, they had to remove it. Uh, anyway, uh, two of those buildings that he had, uh, plus uh, uh, his uh, home, uh, uh, there were more than one. He had at least four homes in Provo, but one still stands, Diana's home. Concluding years, uh, A.O. passed away March 6th of 1895. Burial was in the Provo Cemetery, 11th of March. Uh, a wire I won't pause to read here, but this is a wire uh, from Joseph F. Smith uh, to Diana uh, on his death. It is sent uh, 540 p.m. on the 6th, the day after his passing. Then this little note at the bottom is a little card that was written to Wilfred Woodruff on the occasion. Thou art the mother of many children. She had 12, including my grandfather Orson Parley. Uh, the labor, thy labors have been great in Zion. Thou wilt stand in thy lot in family organizations in the celestial word, world, uh, Wilfred Woodruff. This is his monument in, uh, in uh, Provo City, the front and the back. And, uh, you, uh, his uh, grave marker, uh, his grave marker is right here. Then uh, four of his wives to be shown subsequently are uh, lined up right, and then those four. Uh, then a, a quote or two from the Deseret News. These are uh, just taken from there. In the death of Abraham Owen Smoot, both the church and the state in this part of America have, lo uh, have reason to mourn. A second, at the tabernacle, his remains were viewed by 5,000 people. Uh, Continuing, present were the first presidency, this is at the funeral, Wilford Woodruff, George Q. Cannon, Joseph F. Smith, and three apostles. President Woodruff said he believed that Brother Smoot, as well, uh, uh, he believed that he knew Brother Smoot as well as any man living. Uh, uh, A.O. regarded uh, Wilford as his best friend. Uh, the gospel uh, had gathered as great men as ever had, and Brother Smoot was one of them. The cortege to the cemetery was by far the largest ever seen in Provo. These are, of course, the uh, grave markers for his uh, four wives and uh, their photographs or paintings uh, below. Now, I'll just talk briefly about a commemorative book uh, that uh, I did for the occasion. Uh, I'll show it to you even. Uh, 
it seemed like a good thing to do. Uh, we did so much work on this, and so uh, it's a small book. Uh, this is the uh, leather-bound, uh, what I call the, the commemorative, uh, the uh, collector's edition, collection edition, and uh, this is the soft-bound. Uh, the titles on these are Abraham Owen Smoot, A Legacy from, uh, from Historic uh, Documents. Uh, and uh, we just got this off the press three days ago, this a uh, few days before that. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, giving copies to my family, and, uh, but uh, uh, there will be some books outside uh, uh, there, and you can look at it and examine them there, and uh, uh, you can even purchase one if you want. Uh, they're not very expensive. Well, the leather bound is a little bit because that costs a lot more to have it in leather, but it seemed like a good thing to do on the, in the collector's edition. This is a quote. Uh, about uh, keeping good records that certainly uh, uh, applied to Abraham Owen Smoot, and I try to emulate that as well. I shall endeavor to write some of the things upon this record for the benefit of my posterity. Uh, that shall come after me. Uh, a quote from Abraham Owen Smoot. This is the picture of him at his uh, eldest age that I'm aware of. If we would reap a celestial glory, we must live, observe a celestial law said in 1880, 15 years before his passing. Well, that uh, concludes my uh, presentation. And uh, we have, uh, there is a class that comes. Oh, I need to make another comment or two uh, before uh, uh, we go on because uh, you, uh, otherwise we'll lose time at the end. I want to uh, pay tribute on the book to uh, Doug Lewis, who is here, uh, a grandson, Lauren Lewis Reber, who gave birth to our fifth great-grandchild yesterday. Uh, Kyla Buchanan uh, for their secretarial and organizational work in having this book prepared, to Ben Bean, University of Print Services for coordinating uh, and having it printed. Uh, I've spoken to John Lloyd, uh, uh, John Murphy already, and uh, Jana Lloyd and Colette Rasmussen, but uh, John's uh, summary uh, in, put in brief form is uh, the appendix of this book, and every document that is in the collection is listed there. Uh, now, uh, two other things for you. Uh, there is a display uh, of among the most important documents that John has done, which if you go out just into special collections, uh, you go out of the auditorium, turn to the left, and you go right in the double doors, and you'll see on your left, you can observe the originals of several of these documents that I just spoke to you about. And uh, not all would necessarily be interested in this, but you'd certainly be welcome if you care to be, family and whoever else would like to gather. At 11.30 uh, in the uh, administration building, the A.O. Smoot uh, administration uh, building, uh, the family years ago put up a display of him, and we've taken this occasion to uh, refurbish it and greatly enhance it and we will have a brief uh, dedicatory prayer offered by my cousin Richard Smoot Nixon uh, at that uh, occasion. And uh, uh, you're welcome to come and see that beautiful display if you care to. And, uh, and we, at 11.30 though, we'll gather and then shortly after we'll have that dedicatory prayer. No, I'm sorry, I took a good fraction of the time for questions, but we still have a, a very few minutes, maybe five minutes. Let's thank uh, Professor Smoot for his mm -hmm.